Hi, I'm Polly Kachaka, and I am so excited to be sitting down today with author J.B. Harris, who has just published her debut novel. She has had a career out of the short story and some dabbling into microfiction, but now she has introduced us to The Immigrant's Wife. Uh, a brief synopsis of this book, in 1913, a middle-class girl and a Greek immigrant defy her parents and buck society by eloping. But when TB rips them apart, they give up everything, including each other, for their love and for their child. JB, welcome. Thank you. I'm so excited to have you here. As I told you, my book group read your book and they were very, very excited. We had lots of great conversations. So we have, I brought lots of questions to ask you today. Oh, good. So the first one I'd like to ask you is about the genesis of this book. This is a book of fiction, historical fiction, but my understanding is that it has some roots in reality? It does. Um, originally, I, I like to call it my family history mystery. Um, my grandmother was talking one day about how she, as a young girl, was on the swing set and an old man was watching her swing. And she always wondered if that was her father. And my reaction to that was, wait a minute, we know who your father is. <laughs> so how do you not know who your father is? And she said, no, 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 that was my stepdad. Her biological father had left when she was two and nobody ever knew what happened to him. So I went out and I did the research and I found out what happened to him and I compiled a nonfiction for my family so that they would have as much information as I could find on him. However, I'm not a big fan of the unknown. I, I need to know. <laughs> so what I couldn't find, I made up. And I put aside the nonfiction, which I shared with my family, and I wrote The Immigrant's Wife as a fictional tale. In fact, I did something quite the opposite of what most authors do. My book has all the real names, but a completely fictional story. <laughs> That's great. Now, you mentioned that you did research, like family research and family history research. But this book was set in 1913, so you must have had to do other research as well about the area. And how did you, how did you research this book to prepare for it? A lot of different ways, actually. When you mentioned the area, I went looking for the West End. It doesn't exist anymore in Boston. There is no West End in Boston. So I had to go to the West End Museum. I had to walk the streets as they are now. I have old maps looking at what's then versus what's now. Um, I read a lot of books on the era. I saw movies on the era. I went through picture after picture. Pinterest is helpful. You can go on and look at all the different pictures that people have posted about the era. So a lot of reading, a lot of watching, and a lot of traveling. Now, this one of the things that my book group really loved about this book was how authentic it felt when we were reading between the two shifting points of view of the two main characters. So, but somehow, sometimes we were in Anna's head and sometimes we were in Charles's head, but somehow we always knew where we were and they were very, very different. How did you accomplish this and what made you choose to do that and to tell the story this way? Well, first of all, thank you, um, because that is a little challenging to do. Um, I think I knew I had to tell both sides of the story, because as a woman, you're inclined to tell the female point of view. But I wanted to get Charles's story out there, and honestly, my great-grandfather's story out there, although it is fictional. But I wanted to get the piece where he didn't desert his family. He wasn't a deadbeat dad. That part is true. He, he left for a good reason. And I wanted to tell the story of a man who left for a good reason and really get into that character and give him the emotions and the feelings and the thoughts that someone who would have to leave their wife and unborn child, um, how they would feel when they did that and why they might do that. Mm. And um, one of the other things that my book group really enjoyed was um, there were so many themes in this book and you, you just mentioned emotions and, and you know you kind of this book runs the gamut of emotions you know you feel love and you feel tragedy and sorrow and pain and and you feel frustration and anger there's so much that goes on in this book 
Um, but one of the themes that is still relevant and so timely today, even 110 years after this book is set, is the theme of racism. Mm -hmm. You know, and this is just as important today as it was then. Can you tell me a little bit about, was that a, a theme you intended to put into the book or how did that come about? Actually, it wasn't. Um, I wrote the story without really thinking much about themes. I wanted to tell a story. Um, I did a lot of revisions, so themes did sort of weave their way in. And when you find them, you, you work with them a little bit. But actually, the racism was very organic. Because when you have a middle-class woman in 1913 Boston marry a Greek immigrant in 1913 Boston, neither one of them is happy about the situation, mm -hmm. the, either side. I mean, they are, but the, yeah. their sides are not. So you're going to get racism. You're going to deal with things that come up like, you know, churches and families and societies and how that's handled. Um, one of the things I learned through all my research was that there's always been racism in America, particularly in Boston. And you're going to get different groups through the different years and the different decades. But there's always racism focused on some group at some time, which is a sad state of, of our country, but it is a truism. And one of the things I really liked when I figured out that that was in there as a theme is the ability to look at racism through the eyes of something that happened in 1913 and is no longer really a threat. It allows people in book groups and such to discuss racism without the hot buttons of today. Mm -hmm. And I think that opens up the opportunity for more honest discussion and allows people maybe to learn a little bit more and get a little less defensive. Yeah, it was interesting the discussions that we had really did, you don't just treat it as a very kind of um, shallow subject. Like there's racism presents itself in very different ways in different parts of the story and with different characters. So it was, it was really um, interesting to discuss. And of course, what everybody wanted to know is whether there will be a sequel. Everybody wanted to know when is the next book coming out. So uh, tell me, do you have another book in the pipeline? I do. I have a second book. It is not a sequel. So, but I think everyone's going to like it. The second <laughs> book is uh, the story of a woman in her 80s who has Alzheimer's. But when she was a child, she was a victim of eugenics in America. So she was forcibly sterilized. So here she is, 80 years old, with Alzheimer's and without anyone, any family to help her. So it follows her journey, but we bring in a social worker who has, you know, her life is all planned out one after another. And as you know, as everybody who's lived a few years knows, you can have any plan you want, but life isn't always going to go that way. So things start to happen to her that change her plan. And I'm still working on the title, but I think I'm going to call it The Family You Choose. And it's all about really how they come together and where their families unite and how people sort of choose the people that they're going to travel through life with. But you mentioned a sequel, and there wasn't one in the plans until book groups started happening. And all the book groups started to ask me about a secondary character named Jessie, Anna's sister. Yes. Yeah. What happens to Jessie? Well, I have decided, I'm not going to share what happens to Jessie, but oh. that is what my third book is going to be about. I have decided where she ends up and where she's going and what her journey may be. And I've decided that's going to be book three. So oh, a sequel I'm will so, be I have to go back to my book group and tell them they'll be so <laughs> excited. But I'm very excited to hear about your second book as well. I find it really interesting that you, between this book, which writes about the TB epidemic and some of the uh, factors and the ways that people had to cope during that TB epidemic, and then the, the eugenics, um, you, you're writing, choosing to write about dark periods of American history. I mean, that's kind of creepy and I love it. I mean, it's, I, th I love that. What made you th decide to do that? Well, my, I would say my major influences are Kristen Hanna, Lisa Wingate, Christina Baker Klein. And they write about those sorts of things. 
And what I love about them is I'm reading their book, I'm totally entranced by their characters, but I'm also learning something about, you know, the orphan trains that used to go out west or, you know, about adoption that was handled in not a great way, shall we say. Um, and I started deciding, you know, I want to find out more about what I don't know about America. And I was shocked at how many things there are that they do not teach us in school or did not teach us in school. So as I'm learning about these things like eugenics in America, um, I've sort of, my brain starts going and I think, oh, well, what would it have been like to have to deal with that? And where would that take you and where would that lead you? So that's where those dark things come from. My, my curiosity over these things that I'm not aware of that happen in America, and then my need to sort of create people that experience them. Oh, well, my book group is gonna be thrilled. And speaking of book groups, I understand you told me today that you've got a book group coming up in the studio. Yes, tell yes. me, tell me about so it. So actually I should extend the invitation to everyone watching. Um, what we're gonna do as a follow-up to this interview actually is I'm inviting people to read The Immigrant's Wife to write to me in an email, um, jbharris at jbharrisbooks.com and then once you've read it, once you've emailed me, let me know if you're interested in coming into the studio. We're going to have our own book group. I'm going to be here. You're going to discuss it. I'll answer any questions you might have. I'm really looking up forward to that as a follow-up. Oh, that's going to be great. So they need to buy the book. Where can they find it? Anywhere books are sold. It's in bookstores. If the bookstore itself doesn't have it, they can order it. It's online. Anywhere books are sold, you can find The Immigrant's Wife. Make sure you look for The Immigrant's apostrophe S Wife, or you'll end up with a different book and author, of course, J.B. Harris. Wonderful. And who's the publisher? The publisher is Sunbury Press. Oh, fantastic. Okay. So it was actually an imprint under Milford House, but the, the, the house is Sunbury Press. Well, this has been so much fun talking to you about The Immigrant's Wife. Thank you for coming well, in. Thank you for and having talking me. To me. And I hope you'll consider me for your book group. I, I absolutely have so much will. to say. <laughs> <laughs> I would love to. So thank you very much. And thank you for having me. It's been wonderful.